In this video, learn how to use tape reading to make a professional trade, like we do on our trading desk. Hi, I'm Jeff Holden, head of recruiting at SMB Capital, a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan, trading equities, options, and futures as automated and discretionary traders. In this video, we teach an SMB training student during an in-depth trade review how to use tape reading to make a winning trade. How to use this indicator to spot a trade with edge like our top traders would make at our firm. Let's get to work on sharing this important trading lesson so you can grow your trading account. So this is how to trade a higher time frame resistance to the short side. Um, this is SAVA. Um, and this was on from uh, 9 28, uh, 2021. So, like always, I like to have some pre market motivation quotes just to kind of get my, uh, my mind in the right place. I think it, I find it helps me kind of get even keeled and uh, prepared for the day. I also like to work out, but that's usually done after uh, the market closes. So, um, obviously, you can see some of the quotes. I think my favorite one on this one is, uh, we fall, we break, we fail, but then we rise, we heal, we overcome, so. One quick question about that. I really like the fact that you're doing that um, because not, you know, the quote itself, it's great, but you found something that works for you, right? And you've kind of taken the liberty to make it your own. So like this is something that you said. You didn't say like I get all pumped up and ready to just press buttons. You like found something that kind of gets you in the right mindset to make trading decisions. Is that kind of what? That's exactly what it is. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, because it's different for everybody. I mean, it's different for me. It's probably different for you. But if you find something that works for you, you know, take ownership of it. And so that's great. And I think a lot of people with quotes, they they like to get fired up. They like to get this. Uh, like the motivation and stuff, but I find it like calms me down. Yeah, that's it good. keeps me balanced. Yeah. So, um, and I've just always done it. I've always, even when I was like teenager and stuff, and or I was at school, it's like I had like quotes all over my wall. Like, I've just always done it. I've always liked it, and I think it it helps me. So, I think you just have to find what helps you. So, uh, these are some of the bigger picture market fundamentals. Um, VIX was up 5% to 2142 from the previous day and in the quotations um, for short I like to kind of say if it's a pro or con or a neutral and I consider that a, uh, a pro because obviously volatility is going to be increased um, which is good for day traders so uh, US stock futures were lower I don't remember exactly what they were I think Dow was maybe 155 or and so it was, um, it was it was lower um, not a ton well I guess you can say 155 is lower but it's significant but um, in this market um, yeah so the global energy crisis in Europe continued to get worse uh, Brent reached $80 a barrel um, I guess it's, it was, I think it was its three-year highs so uh, Treasury 10-year yields climbed to 1.544% Federal Reserve officials warned of serious consequences if debt ceiling was not raised, and then the House was going to vote. I, there were there were a, uh, a few things in the pipeline in terms of um, congressional bills that wanted to be passed, but uh, there's just kind of a lot of uncertainty. Um, I think the biggest one for this was the uh, the fix was up, and then you have kind of some of this Federal Reserve stuff going on too. So, and the debt ceiling, um, I mean that's a huge one, especially. Um, considering I'm taking a trade to the short side and I'm not to the long side. So, If you want to learn three more real-world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven-figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing now at the top right-hand corner of your screen. That will open up the free registration page in a new window, so don't worry, you won't lose this video. You can also visit tradingworkshop.com to register for this free intensive workshop. You're going to learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. These were some of the fundamental drivers for Sava. Um, talked about this before, but they're, the main driver of this move has been its Alzheimer's drug, Simufilam. Um, 
and the enthusiasm, uh, the investor enthusiasm behind that. And there's been so much, as you'll see in the daily chart, there's been so much volatility with this stock. I mean, it goes up and down depending on this news. Um, so in the last few weeks, uh, it's been a little bit better, but... Is um, there any other drugs that have gone to phase two to phase three in for, the Alzheimer's space? Uh, not that I know of, and yeah. so I think... So that's huge, right? It's massive. Because yeah. everybody knows what Alzheimer's is. Steve talks about this in his morning call every single day. Anytime there's a drug news thing, probably not every day. but. It's something that everybody understands. It's something that if cured could be a big, big, big deal, or if treatable would be a huge deal. And then you also have something that isn't, there aren't a bunch of other drugs out there. So you're talking about a massive catalyst for a company. Yeah. Um, that, the fact that, that the catalyst is that big could lead to a tremendous amount of volatility as people figure all this stuff out. And so it's good to know the basis of, of what you're covering that, you know, if this is something that comes out this way, that's huge. So um, being aware of that's really good. Um, also, I really like your next point, and so you can kind of. The week prior to this, there's, there were so many um, the medical researchers and experts that critiqued and even gave real concerns about the efficacy of their studies. Um, which I, th which, I mean, that's that's huge. And so, and I mean, there were two experts with publications all over the world that that critiqued this study. There are some of their studies on Alzheimer's, especially with this drug. So um, it was really negative. And as you can see from the chart that we're going to pull up, it's just um, you can almost see where the bullish and the bearish news has kind of hit this this uh, this stock. Um, so this next one, I mean, obviously. Alzheimer's is, as you were just saying, it's a huge issue worldwide, 50 million people. Um, and I've seen news stories that say that's expected to increase dramatically by 2050, too, with dementia, too. So um, short float is almost 20 percent, um, which I consider good because I think shorts are going to attack it at key levels. So uh, and, and then average analyst target price is uh, 94. I just took the average of the of all the big ones. So. Um, this one isn't really, I just like to kind of get the best picture I can of the stock. Um, I don't necessarily use this in any specific way, but it's good to get a, a general picture of what the analysts rate it as, right? and especially see their price targets. So um, it didn't really come into play for this trade specifically, um, but I just like to put it up there. So. Uh, this is these are variables for shorting resistance. These are what I like to use. Um, so lower volume and candle and I didn't put the word there, but lower volume and uh, small candlestick bodies into resistance um, to show kind of show that the momentum is slowing. Um, recent resistance such as on the 15th hourly or daily chart, uh, weaker tape into resistance, strength within the first hour. Ideally, a rip near the open, which that probably doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but I like to see um, for this trade specifically strength at the open rather than kind of a chop or grind into the resistance. Um, and we'll go ahead and go to the the charts, but um, then I use some other the other indicators uh, to further kind of confirm what I'm um, looking for. So. The, this is SPY. As you can see, um, SPY gap down, or SPY futures were uh, down, or not SPY futures, ES futures were down 0.7%. Um, and everything I, everything I kind of saw with VIX and uh, some of the other congressional stuff, and um, it just pointed to a kind of a grim day because there really wasn't a lot of support um, under 440. Uh, maybe 435, maybe 436, but if volume came in, I anticipated um, that it was going to be a pretty rough day uh, for the markets. Um, this is XLV, which is the healthcare ETF. Um, this had a pretty red day on the, uh, the day prior. It sold off on 1.5% uh, on heavy volume. So I was kind of mainly watching to see if there was uh, 
support uh, around the 128, 127, but um, as you can see from the volume node, um, there is some room down on that. This doesn't have a big ATR, but um, it's something I watch when I trade healthcare stocks. Sava kind of has a heartbeat of its own, so it does its own thing somewhat, but um, I like to kind of keep a, a bigger picture in mind. This is VIX. Uh, VIX opened higher and over that kind of the historical average of 20. So um, I was watching that. I think if uh, that, if VIX was remained elevated and higher, this trade had a higher chance of working out. And this is the multi time frame of Sava. So um, as you can see, it. I mean, there's just so much to talk about on this chart. It's Let's just, go with the daily. I like yeah. the daily in this one. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably. The, start with the daily, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, had that initial run up in February from Alzheimer's and then kind of came back down, consolidated a little bit. Um, and as investors kind of soaked in the news, it had a ramp back up. And then another Alzheimer's, something, ha something happened in August with the, uh, the news. I think it, um, something to do with their phase two studies either being delayed or uh, problems with it and it came back down and then we're kind of right back up. But uh, in September, um, there's been quite a few different news stories that we kind of talked about earlier. But as you can note, the volume has really increased in September. Um, B. Riley and Maxim, the analysts, uh, actually rated this as a buy. I think I buried it as a buy with $190 and 109 price targets on it. So it's had some bullish news in it. Um, and as you can see, that 40 level is, is, is long-term support on that. Um, but in the last week or so, it's, it was up 75%. Um, real nice move up, but it was coming into some of that, uh, some of that key resistance levels, um, either whether you use indicators or just uh, the price. Um, it was a kind of a key area into that 65 to 70 range. Um, so. Yeah, and that's, that's, I think, the part that's the most interesting to me. We're not talking about taking the short at $40. You're not talking about taking the short at $50. This is coming into a very, very important level because that's the breakdown price is like basically 70 bucks. If you look across the daily, like you can run a line across the bottom of kind of all those and think about it from a buyer seller perspective. Like, you know, it didn't spend like a day up there. It did so much volume and spent so much time above $70 and even basically doubled from there. So it coming all the way down to 40 and then that quick rally up to 70, like, you know, this trade would be a trade that would be a little more difficult to take if you weren't coming right into a key level. The fact that you're coming into a key area, key level, and levels aren't perfect, you know, you can have stuff that changes and you can have levels that aren't supported, but it's really important on these stocks, particularly if you're considering this as the potential of a backside. Right, because that's ultimately what this trade is. It's a backside trade. Mm -hmm. um, you have kind of the blow off extension, you have the huge pull in, you have another rally, and then you have kind of this move down. By this point, a lot of people have stopped paying attention to it. Yeah. But when it comes, like you said, there's a tremendous amount of volume there. So there's liquidity. <clears throat> it's coming into a super, super important area. And those areas can be psychological. They can be round numbers. It could have come up to 100, and that's like a psychological level. This happens to be more of an impactful level because you have so much volume done above those prices, and it's supported there so many times, and then a gap down below there. And so it's coming back up, and you would think that there's probably natural sellers there. Um, there may not be, but that's, you know, it's an important factor. So when I look at this, this chart, especially the daily chart, like the other ones are fine, but the daily chart's the one that matters to me, yeah. of you see how many people basically were probably long from above there, and now it's back into that area, and it didn't like grind up, it accelerated up into the area. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what you're looking for if you want to potentially put on a short, is right. that acceleration, is that kind of change in character, but it comes right into a resistance area. So, you know, um, 
the likelihood that there are probably some sellers there, you know, is pretty high, it seems. And even Savo was gapping down um, the top left of the chart. It was gapping down to around 65. And on the this day, I was like, oh gosh, like I don't want this to gap down too much because that's kind of, it's coming into like where I would have taken profits or and it's yeah. just, so, and then you kind of get, it was, I think this ATR is around eight. So, I mean, if it gaps down to like 63, 64, I just, I didn't see the trade worth taking if it gapped down too much. I wanted it to stay ideally around 66, 67, and then um, there was just be more meat on the bone per se. So um, it ended up, um, actually a little bit, we could talk about this real quick. This is um, kind of a, uh, a closer view of the daily chart with that 50 and 100 moving average. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on at that 70 level. This is just kind of another indicator um, that this is a, a key level. So um, I use the 50 and 100 day on the daily quite a bit. So uh, these are int some intraday fundamentals. Um, average volume 7.6. I like to rate them, like I said. So uh, 7.6 million. Uh, our vol on this was, I think it was around three. Um, and then the ATR is 8.4, which is pretty high. So you have to control your risk on that. Uh, short float 23.74, which is very high. So actually, yeah, it's very high. So institutional ownership, 24%. Um, that's actually not as high. I don't know why I put high. It should be to the lower end. Uh, float 37.42, uh, which is a mid cap. And then market cap is 2.8 billion. Uh, so this was my battle plan per se. Uh, Sava has been extremely volatile over the last few months. On the morning of 9.28, Sava was up over 75% in the last week and it looked like a pullback was likely, uh, especially when taking into account the overall market weakness. Uh, Sava was just under that uh, key 50 and 100 day moving averages that we could have talked about. Um, and I saw a retracement back, back down to at least 60s. Um, only issue would be that I saw was those uh, PT targets of uh, 109 and 190 from uh, B. Riley and, and Maxim. So um, really not a big deal. I mean, that's more of a longer time, longer time frame for analysts, but um, there's really didn't see much that uh, this would have dissuaded me from taking the trade. Um, and I only wanted to take this trade if we see a pop near the open um, into ideally that 67, 68 area you know, you kind of set yourself up for this trade, right? You're not going to hit it right off the open because of the price action uh, or because it's where, where it's opening, but you're game planning for the trade in advance. And so are you thinking through, okay, what does the tape need to look like if it gets up there? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you thinking through how should it feel on the tape when it gets, if it gets to those levels? Mm -hmm. um, because this can happen so fast yeah. and it's good that you've identified areas that you want to be short from but you want to have a couple scenarios mapped out of what if it goes up holds up and then doesn't break down yeah. what potentially could that mean yeah. what if it goes up and gives you that opportunity you're looking for on the tape mm -hmm. you know how are you going to manage it that way and so coming in with a plan which you're doing and then coming in calm mm -hmm. to just let it do what it's going to do is super important yeah. because otherwise it's like you're kind of rushing around trying to do a lot thinking what else can happen all that stuff and it can be very challenging mm -hmm. um so let's talk about some of the some of the trades that you saw here um mm -hmm. and how that how that really set up. So these are some of my entry rules. Uh, clear weakness in chart um, and tape. Uh, another indicator that I use is trend candles. Um, trade needs to start working quickly. I don't want to have to wait for this. Um, I think the longer that I wait for this and the more it pushes up as time goes on, the less likely it is for me to refer it to work. Um, lower volume on the ramp up and high volume on the rejection or resistance and sub subsequent sell off. Um, elevated R vol, and uh, that's just kind of what it, the last one is kind of what I use um, to judge my how much how much weight size I should put on the trade. Uh, this is just something I kind of like to do to visualize the trade. Um, number one is exactly what I want to see. The red line is VWAP. 
Um, I wanted to see a push at the open, maybe a minor pullback, and then another push into that resistance area. I didn't want to see this, you know, going below VWAP and then coming back up, and um, or just kind of chopping around and consolidating, or just trailing VWAP up. I wanted to see uh, a strong open. Uh, this is opening bell for the XLV and SPY. As you can see, um, the market and sector were in my favor um, quite a bit on this. XLV and SPY both gapped down and continued um, and had quite a bit of continue or continuation uh, in the first hour. Uh, and here's my trade management. Um, so as you can see in the pre-market, it hit a low of 63.50, which I was thinking at this point, I was actually about to cross this off my watch list because I was like, this probably is not going to work. And then I started to kind of see it come back up or around 30 minutes to open. Um, and it kind of gave it more, a little bit more attention. And I think that 65 area was pretty, was pretty key because as you can see in the pre-market, once it got over 65 um, and then it opened, it had a nice little squeeze up to the area. Um, the blue line on top is was my ideal area that I wanted it get to get to, and I think one of the things I struggle with is waiting for it to come to exactly my line or my area. I want it to like it's just something I struggle with. I, I want it to come exactly to me, and um, even if it's like a few cents or something, I mean it's just. It's just something I've been working on. And I'm, I think Carlton said the other day um, that you can even just kind of start to size in a little bit. If it's not at, at, to your exact level and you feel good about the trade, just size in um, a little bit smaller. And so that's kind of what I did. Um, I started sizing in around 67.50 and 67.71. Um, and when it made a ramp up over 67, uh, it started to get spreadier. Um, there wasn't much volume at the top. Uh, and I started noticing, um, I filter out my time in sales, started noticing some a lot bigger orders um, over 67 um, on the bid. So there was, there was a lot of selling. It, the, the tape was different from 65 to 66. It was strong. I mean, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, orders on the ask. Um, it was just, it was, it was fast from 65 to 66, and then it started to slow from 67. And I started noticing uh, a lot of a lot bigger orders um, going through on the bid from 67 to 67.50, and then at the top it just kind of stalled out um, and came back through 67. Um, and my first profit target let's, on this. Let's talk about that because I think mm -hmm. that that is sorry to jump in, oh, but I fine. really think that what you just described, first of all, is a huge change in the way that you and I have talked about your trading over the last couple of weeks, couple months. Um, more importantly, it alleviates a lot of the pressure of what you're talking about. You talked about 68 and a half as your level. That's your ideal spot. That's good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I trade every single day and I always have offers and bids out at really interesting prices mm -hmm. on the open for stocks that I'm really interested in. If it would have gotten to 68 and a half, that would have been great. I'd say 90% of the time at about 10 o'clock, I'm closing out empty orders because they just never got to prices that I yeah. cared about. A lot of times they get close. So having that skill of being able to understand what's actually happening versus what you just kind of hope happens <laughs> opens up your trading so much. And what you're talking about, I think, the value add of being able to recognize what's happening on the tape at $65 where you definitely don't have edge, at $66 where you certainly still don't have edge. But as it gets above 67, then you're starting to see those things that lead into, maybe I have edge here even though it's not at 68 and a half. So I can be in some, and then the thought process is what do I need to see to be in more? Sometimes that's a move to 68 and a half. Sometimes it's just what you saw on the tape. Yeah, that's good. And when it's what you saw on the tape, that's really an opportunity to be very, very, very tight with your risk, but find ways to be bigger. Because this trade has gone from, I mean, you almost crossed it off your list. So if it would have opened at $64, 63 and a half, that's like a D setup, right? Yeah. When it opens at 65, it's like a C setup. 
When it goes to 66, it's like a B setup. Exactly. Then it goes to 67 <laughs> and above 67 with a super heavy tape where they're all of a sudden on the bid versus like just being taken for sales up. You're seeing sizes increase. You're seeing it get spreadier, which kind of means it's unsustainable a lot of times. And then you're just looking for that real change. Well, you started to see that change on the way up yeah. and you've identified an area that you could, that could be very, very important for this stock. Yeah. You've taken a D trade before the open that almost wasn't worth your time and turned it into, allowed it to turn into an A trade yeah. because of being prepared, having tape reading skills, and then understanding the, the bigger picture narrative of what was happening. Yeah. I, I don't think you want to underestimate the value of those things. <laughs> no, for sure. And I, I think I did for a long time until I got to SMB with in terms of tape rating. Yeah. And so it's almost added like another tool to my arsenal that the more I learn it and the more I understand it, the more conviction I have with trades. And that's, I mean, and that's kind of priceless in terms of trading, so. And we were talking about CEI earlier, and that's the exact same thing. It's understanding the changes. It's understanding what could happen. And it's not being, it's not showing up ready to like press buttons. It's showing up ready to listen. It's showing up, you know, what you did in your pre-market prep of showing up like, I'm gonna stay calm and just see what happens sort of thing. And that preparedness, combined with, you know, kind of those tape reading skills, combined with the understanding of the bigger picture of what's happening in this stock, you know, at no point did, did you say, I just wanted to be short against this level. Mm -hmm. You were open to the way it would play out and you walked into a very, very, very nice trade. And I didn't talk about my stop because I didn't necessarily have a hard stop. I was gonna add up to 68.50. Um, and I know a lot of people use hard stops. They say, oh, I'll just stop out over 68.50, but I kind of like to wait, see um, how it interacts with that level before putting a hard stop. I don't want to get it stop on. So, um, I, especially on this trade, sometimes I do use hard stops, uh, but for something that's moving like this off the open, I kind of like to get it, give it some time to see how it interacts. Does it hit the 68.50 and close over 68.50? Um, how does the tape look at 6850? So, or does it pull back to 68 and then ramp back back up over 6850? Um, it's kind of all how it interacts and how much time it takes to um, how much time it takes to um, move over there or move under there. So, um, for this one, I didn't. I obviously didn't get that ad, so um, I wasn't in as heavy of a size on this trade. But something I'm really impressed about me is that maybe even a few months ago or maybe five or six months ago before I started talking with Justin, I would have just waited for 68.50. And so I didn't do that. You'd and so still be waiting for 68.50. I'd, sti I, I'd still be waiting. <laughs> that's, that's maybe not, I, I haven't looked at the seven chart, but, that's, but the fact that you uh, can make that adjustment is really yeah. important because it, that's what trading is. And I loved what you said about you you have, we always have a hard stop. Mm -hmm. We always have an idea of the risk we're putting on in the trade and we're always responsible with risk. Mm -hmm. One really important way to be responsible with your risk is by using the tape. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it spikes up there and you see everything you wanna see and it starts to drop down and then it, you know, a big bidder steps up and starts grinding the tape higher. Well, you hit out a half and then you're managing your risk effectively and then you can retry it at 68.50 if it gets up there and you see what you wanna see on the tape. Um, that's a pretty normal thing to have happen. Yeah. Uh, and then the trade really starts to work. So it stops out everybody that was short up into there, but then you know maybe you take off half or three quarters or whatever your math is on that trade. Yeah. Um, maybe you start smaller like you talked about because when you're expecting or when there's the potential of a big enough move, you can be pretty small and still make a very nice trade um, just by allowing it to work. And, and so there are a lot of different ways to do the same thing. And it sounds like what you're talking about is you found more ways to do the same thing you wanted to do before by adding those different tools in, by understanding the bigger picture, by doing the tape reading at the, at the important areas. Right. 
because if you're just reading tape generically, it's not going to add any value. But if you're paying more attention to it as it gets closer to more important areas, then you're going to add a ton of value to your trading. That's true. Uh, so I covered half into 65, and then um, I think one of the things for this one, I probably held on to that. I, I generally like to hold on to, Justin's kind of taught me to hold on to 10% um, for as long as you kind of can or until you're proven wrong. And I probably should have, what do you think if I should, when I ramp back up over 65, do you think I should have covered the rest of it? It's tough. Um, I actually would have added there. I would have reestablished. Uh, probably not that first ramp up, okay. but after, you know, Oh, so your your time is central time, correct? On your chart. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So after like 10.30 Eastern, mm -hmm. when it rallies that second time and reclaims 65, but then can't break higher, mm -hmm. you know, that's essentially you've built a lower high end. So I probably would have added there with the expectation that it would, if it was a trending trade, you know, a, tr a trend, trend trade, which we talk about a lot. That's what Justin would want you to keep 10% on. If it's yeah. a 10, if it's a trend, trend trade, you're gonna to wanna to hold it all the way back. It should, it's made a lower high, it should go make a lower low. Yeah, because I was anticipating maybe we could see 60, but. Correct, um, so how would you see 60? You'd see that rally to 65, which is super normal. Um, you'd see a failure at 65, which you just saw. It was a messy failure, but it was a failure at 65. And then you'd see it make its way down to 60. Yeah, but once it started coming back up, I was like, and then reclaiming view up, I, especially over 64 and 64.50, I, I, I just, I thought this could, um, the, the likelihood of it hitting 60 uh, was was less likely than it kind of continuing to move over 65. Um, so I just kind of got out. I think I got it's out. It's made of a higher case, low, but, so it's, yeah. it's consolidating at that point. I think where you exited was very good. I think the one thing you want to consider is you did all the all the work to identify the first level. And you even called out in, earlier in our discussion how important 65 was. Mm -hmm. So you could, you know, kind of, you see it pop up to 65 and you don't want to be too eager. Yeah. But especially that second time when, when it pulls into 63 and a half, rallies back up to 65 and then can't lift. Mm -hmm. Like that could be something where you want to put some risk on. Yeah. And then you can move your stop down and then adjust. I really like your the last exit though because you're adjusting to the stock. You're not mm -hmm. saying hard stop above 65 and a half, you're actually saving yourself a point by exiting to what's happening yeah. versus just giving it a hard stop. Mm -hmm. That's again using your tape reading skills just in a different way. Yeah. You know, you're using a higher time frame tape reading of what should have happened. It should have started to grind and go to new lows. It didn't. So, you know, what's the tape is not telling you that it's going to grind to new lows. So yeah. the trade's over. So I, I, I really like this trade. It, it's a trade that does require a pretty good amount of management, mm -hmm. but it's a trade that you can make most days. You know what's interesting? I, I, I trade this stock so much, and the very next day, this did the exact same thing. It went to 68, and actually the next day, it came all the way down to 60. Yeah. The same thing. Uh, I didn't take it the next day, but it's like, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And yeah. like, I could have easily taken it again the next day. And, and it's not even, the, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll push back on that because mm -hmm. I don't think it's the stock. I think yeah. it's the setup. You have high volatility into res a high volatility stock and a high volatility environment into a resistance level. Mm -hmm. So yeah. identify all the different times that that could happen. You know, you could, you could trade probably 30 different stocks in that same setup with a high volatility stock that I can think of right now. A high volatility stock with in a high volatility environment, which we're seeing, you know, with really, really good range. So, you know, I would I wouldn't sell yourself short and say it's about Sava. It's really about picking the right stocks for well, you. Well what I mean I think what I mean by that is that sometimes I um I have a tendency to try and find like something new. Like the next day when I can just trade the same setup yep and so it's like i'm constantly it's not this it's this little battle in my mind it's like okay there's let's find something new to trade um when i've been making when i've been doing so well on sava and so uh yeah i think i've just got to get my mind in the habit of being like okay if the setup is there even if it's the same setup i took in the previous day take it again guys are doing that on the desk with amc guys yeah. are doing that on the desk this week with, with cei you're just coming back to that 
that name and it's not I like to I'll, I'll argue and I, I don't think it's the name because I think people get attached to names yeah. but I think it's the setup okay. right you've got a ton of resistance at that 70 level 68 to 70 level that we just talked about you have a stock that has a lot of range yeah. like you know wow. you yeah so like every time it gets up there you want to be paying attention to it mm-hmm. on an intraday basis you know, you're getting ATR moves, which is great. Yeah. So, you know, don't don't feel like you need to rush off to the next thing all the time mm-hmm. if you're getting what you want. Just respect the fact that when this range starts to compress, don't bang your head against the wall being like, I'm gonna short it every time. I'm gonna keep doing what was working right. because it's working. Um, you're gonna wanna move on to the next stock that's working very well, yeah. that's acting well. Um, but traders on the desk that have found things that are working well and been able to stick with them have been um, really outperforming, especially recently. Yeah. And I always like, I, I, you start to get a feel for the stock. Um, you know, I wouldn't say married to it, but I guess it, I mean, there can be the cons to it, but like I've been trading this so much, I understand how it moves, I understand the tape. Um, there's just different variables that uh, I feel not only comfortable with it, but it also adds to my conviction for yeah. it. Uh, because I know this thing at 70 is such a key level. That's why I took the trade. It's such a key level. Um, I remember it from previous trades, from uh, previous alerts, that it's a key level. And so it adds to my conviction rather than just popping up a, a ticker, doing some DD on it and for 15, 20 minutes and then just say trading it. Yeah. Um, like it's like a reacquainting with like an old friend. It's yeah. like it, it's just um, it's, a, it's almost com- more comes more natural uh, trading the ticker. Um, and obviously you don't want to get overly confident on it, but... Um, but it's amazing because we yeah. could have this same discussion about the way people trade Tesla, the way people trade yeah. AMC, the way people sure. trade GME, and it's not the stock itself. And it's yeah. certainly having a repertoire of, oh, this is a stock that has a tendency to, when it gets to important prices, the tape opens up. Yeah. You know, you build that up over time right like you you're getting an experience a number a sample number of one right you build that up over time and then next time we talk about a trade idea you can say oh the tapes actually a lot like sava and it's like oh yeah so i know exactly what you're talking about with that it wicks around like sava does you know it goes too far in both directions a lot of the time so in my mind when you tell me that all of a sudden i'm thinking okay i need to be a little tighter with my risk and i really need to lay into my tape reading skills there are other stocks that really cleanly respect levels. There are other stocks that we talk about that, you know, the big three things we talk about on our desk, they touch a lot of prices, they respect levels really, really cleanly, or they're big, you know, they're, they're like high beta stocks that are being asked to trade sometimes when they're not in play. Um, those are the three that I constantly hear people talking about on the desk because it's like, if something respects levels really well, you know you can be really sized against levels. If something touches a lot of prices like a Sava or a Tesla or, you know, take take your pick on all those, you know you have to be very, very tight with your risk management yeah, that's true. and your execution. You also know when the trade starts to work, you let it work because it should really, really work for you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, don't necessarily think that when the Sava trades go away, you can't take that exact same skill of, oh, this is a high volatility stock, it's touching a lot of prices, I really need to make sure that I'm reading the tape very closely on this one at important points. And then apply that to the next trade and the next trade and the next trade because you'll see stocks like this a lot. So I would really think about the details of what you've seen so that the next time we're talking about a trade, you can just say like, oh, the tape's a lot like Sava, (laughs) you know? And that gives me a ton of information, and then you're making the desk better because of that. So, um, this is just my trade review. Um, kind of what we talked about earlier that support and resistance is not a line in the sand, but a zone, an area. Um, I did enter before it entered my zone, um, but deciding how much conviction to put on a trade is an area I need to work on. Um, so, even when it was happening, I was like, I don't know how much to put on this because it's like it's outside of my. Uh, my comfort zone yep. like I don't it's like okay it's not quite there yet so I don't know how much to put it on it but 
Um, I ended up Were just you doing... bigger in this trade than you would have been a month ago? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So measure Which progress is that way. Because I didn't, at first I was thinking, okay, like, I, okay, I'm more comfortable with myself. Like looking back on some of my trading journals and like which my trading in general, um, maybe not a month ago, maybe two months ago, but um, yeah, I'm just more comfortable. And I'm, since I've been here, it's like, I've gotten, I'm just getting so much better by the day. Like just more, and not just more confident, like um, I'm seeing things better. I'm seeing stuff on the tape better. Um, I'm hearing other traders, their ideas. I mean, that's invaluable. Hearing other traders' ideas. I mean, because all I had before was just headsets, discord rooms, and like it's, it's so, there's so much noise in there. But I'm hearing such valuable noise here. Like what do you what you hear at the trade desk is so much different than all these other chat rooms and stuff. It's really good traders that are perfecting their craft and working on it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love love it here. So yeah, and that's you know, that's the thing that you want to think about is did I trade this with more risk as it was a better setup than I would have a month ago? Yeah. Because then, you know, it's the last day of the month. We're going to do monthly reviews starting today. Like, yeah. you're going to want to think, did I trade that specific be setup better than I would have a month ago? And if yes, okay, how did you do that? Okay, how do you grow from there? You know, those little factors become kind of that growth loop that we talk about a lot or, you know, where you set your goal setting. So that's great that you, and you should not undervalue that either of making sure that you're, pushing yourself to be better than you were yeah. a month ago. Yeah. You know. It's true. Um, and then do not get married to a stock, although I've been trading Safa well lately. Um, in the back of my mind, I just hear like, oh, I could have taken this trade, I could have taken this trade, but I mean, it worked for me. So um, not a big deal. It's just, I think we're constantly fighting these thoughts in our head. Um, and sometimes you just need to keep them at bay and say, hey, this worked. Uh, maybe it's not the sexiest trade. Maybe it's not the sexiest ticker out there, uh, but it worked. So. Um, and then great technical setup that provided a good RR, overall nice trade, and then I just grade myself and, too. Yeah, and what worked about it? And like that's that's kind of a vague statement and I hear that a lot. Oh, it worked, I, I battle that in my own trading. I'm like, oh, the trade worked, so it's worth it. And that doesn't always, it's vague. It's vague. Yeah. What worked about it was you were very definitive about the area that you found important. You were very specific about what you saw on the tape that allowed you to enter with two lots of risk. You know, you were very defined with all of the things that led into that trade. None of that stuff is just, oh, the trade worked. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like, don't think, does a trade work or not work? Think about this as a skill development game. What did you do specifically well in this trade that allowed it to work? because somebody else could have taken the same trade and it didn't work. Yeah. It doesn't mean it was a bad decision-making process on their part all the time. It just means that they weren't seeing the, the information that yeah. you were seeing. Um, really kind of think through the specifics of did it, not just did it work, but why did it work? Yeah, I added this slide on about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> So I was like, I, uh, I did it on my phone and then didn't save. So I was like looking kind of for feeler statements on there. <laughs> no, you're good. But like, yeah. it's, that's an important thing of when you're reviewing your trades, because you're going to see this setup occur in a low flow. You'll see this setup occur in a mega cap tech stock. You'll see this setup occur in the market. It happened two or three times this week in the market. Like if you're trading queues, this exact same setup occurred like two or three times this week. I think it even occurred today. Um, and spy at least. So you're gonna see this setup happen over and over and over and the more you can be specific about, okay, why did it work that time? Oh, it runs up into a level and then I'm watching the tape and the tape kind of shows me that it's running out of steam to the upside. That doesn't mean you just like pile on risk, no questions asked, this is my A plus setup, but it gives you information so that all of a sudden you go from, oh, I hope I picked the best stock and, and your, your focus goes from, from hoping that you're picking the best stocks to having an arsenal of things that you can do each day. Yeah. And then you can show up and you can have a list of five things and maybe four of them work and one doesn't. But out of those five things, you're probably gonna find a trade in one of them. And it'll be, if you can execute the way that you're talking about it, it'll be a good trade. Yeah. And then you're building that confidence and then you're growing and then you're developing. And then yeah. that's ultimately you're looking back and you have a good trading career. 
because of that. That's good. So I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't undervalue the importance of this trade. I wouldn't overvalue how it's Sava because it's super easy to be like, I trade Sava really well, I'll just do this and I'll do this. And you know, I talk with people that trade Tesla really well. They say that, oh, I have a really good feel for Tesla. And it's like, yeah, that's fine. But Tesla's in play like 80% of the time. <laughs> like, like, you know, wait till the, t what do you do on the 20% of the time when it's not in play? Yeah, like, you know. Even, even if something's in play 80% of the time, it's only four days a week, right? So what do you do on that other day? You just not trade? Like, you're, as a trader, you want to find opportunity, and then you want to have the tape reading skills to be able to take advantage of it. And then you want to do all the other work to be able to understand what's the bigger picture. How can I translate what I know in this stock to the next stock, and then to the next stock, and then to the next stock? Mm -hmm. um, and be open to new information too, because if Sava would have blown up through, you know, 6850, held higher, and then broke out above 80, like maybe it's the day that it runs. And you don't want to be fighting it the entire time either and saying, like, oh, no, this stock is definitely coming down, because sometimes they don't, and you can't put yourself in that position. Yeah. So. I'm usually pretty good at, uh, at knowing when I'm wrong and yeah. realizing it. And I think that's important to be as a trader, is, uh, yeah. is not being. Um, so hard-headed that you can't let a stock go when you know you're wrong. Yeah. So and trying to sit there and revenge and impose your will on it. So um, I tend to be more humble and to be like, okay, I'm wrong. I yeah. need to get out. Yeah. So. And then you just move out of the next setup and the next setup, and then it's just a series of decision making. You know, it's a series of decisions that you're making. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I like it. I I really like this trade. I think it's a great trade. I think there are ways that you can get better at it, particularly after the trade really works, what should happen next? Yeah. And you should get that pop up. So how are you going to respond? Because then all of a sudden you've gone from making one good trade on the open to a really good morning trade with the potential for a trend trade. I think one of the things that also is that I tend to, I've, I've been trading for a few years now, and I, I think I'm having a hard time vocalizing what I know about the ticker. Yeah. Like I keep saying like I had a good feel, but I'm having a hard time putting into words what exactly I felt and what exactly I thought about that trade. And so I think as I've been here, I've been able to put kind of language to that, but um, yeah, I guess it's I guess vocalizing like what exactly about this do I feel that's good? Because I, I knew that setup. I knew, hey, if it rips it, why do I want it to rip it at the open? I don't know why I want it to necessarily rip at the open. I just, I feel like I've seen it so many times that it can rip into this level, and the quicker it gets there, the better, and then it can retrace. Yep. But I don't know why I want it to do that. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, um, yeah I don't really... That's too uh, meta for me. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, sorry, yeah. I don't know why I don't want. I don't know why I like that setup either. Yeah. I, I, I can I can logically say. So the, when you look at the chart from the prior day, you have the breakout or not breakout, but you have the failure at seventy. All of a sudden, it's gapping down to sixty-five. I want some sort of spot to put risk against. Mm -hmm. So I do want that up move. Okay. It's a much tougher trade if I have to hit it down. But it's also the amount of time it takes to get there, though, too. If it's still pushing at like 11 or 12, yeah, it's, it's like you don't want to do it. This is a different trade. It's a yeah. midday fade trade, uh, okay. right? So it's yeah. like if it holds up, consolidates, breaks higher, then kind of you know tests that level midday and then starts to roll, then you have the potential. Like the Justin loves the the um, the top, the arch top, whatever he calls it. Like. Um, I can't remember what he what does he call it. It's what do you the, mean the the dome top or whatever where it's building that top and oh it yeah takes yeah like a long time and then it kind of cracks. Uh, yeah. and goes. I don't know if he has a specific name for it, okay. but I know what you're talking He's about. He's told though. me about it a couple times, but uh, so you have a couple different trades that can play out later in the day at that level mm -hmm. if it doesn't just rip up there on the open. Yeah. That's why you do the playbook because what if it gaps down, has massive massive volume, and just sells off. Um, are you going to be frustrated that you missed the trade? I wouldn't be because that's not my trade in this situation. Yeah. Like my trade in this situation is this, the trade that you made. Um, what if it hadn't gapped down though? Would you have still taken, I, I, it almost added to my conviction that it did gap down. Like, but I mean, it's, it's small, it's yeah. small, but I think it, yeah, the yeah. more variables in my favor, the better, but. Yeah, 
But the gap down run up is one of the best setups for a short I've, I, that I've yeah. seen. Um, the gap down run up into resistance. Yeah, that's, right. that's, that's yeah, 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 yeah. So now, now using technology, you're scanning for those gap down run ups every single day. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of my favorite trades to take yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like it because you have you have a level that it should find resistance at, and if it gets above that level, you know it's a hands-off trade. You know you know that you're wrong, yeah. and if it doesn't, if it fails the way this did, you know that there should be some pretty significant downside. Yeah. Um, so I like that trade as well. Uh, you can make it the other way too. Something closes at the lows, small gap up, flush back towards the lows, yeah. and then try and look for the upside. Um, I think we're programmed to, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, as traders, I think we're programmed to associate certain patterns with certain things. And some of us like patterns, different patterns than others. Some people really like the tight consolidations. I, I hate those. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I feel like I lose, <laughs> lose those all the time. Um, uh. There are times that I'll take them. And I've had to do the playbook work in order to understand the situations that I should take them, but I need way more checks in my favor for that trade than other people do. Yeah. Uh, some people need way more checks in their favor for the it, the trade that we're just talking about than than we do. You know, they would need to see it run up in the first five minutes. They would need to see you know a clean failure at resistance. Then actually, they're not going to even short it until it's back below the open, because that's another short that you could actually add where you were taking risk off. Like you could actually add there. There are people that like legitimately are like it's back through open. I'm adding, like you know, and that's. And I think that I've gotten a little bit better at that too. Like, somebody I used to just take it to one trade and be out, but yeah. there's so many more opportunities throughout the day that yeah. you can short the pops into. Yeah, yeah. And so like I in mean, this one, I really like that. That it didn't work at all, but that pop into 65 because if this is a trending down trade, that is your opportunity to get size on you have a natural stop above that kind of yeah. second peak or whatever you want to call it. It has, you should see the volume increasing, you should see it go to new lows, so you have pretty good risk reward. And you should see kind of it not go down and then lift up the But do you partial at the lows or do you partial when it hits 64 for a point? Like, like when are you gonna to start to partial on that trade if you take it when it, yeah. To, to enter. Like when are you gonna to start to scale out when it, it if you take it at the short? The tape. Like okay. honestly, like, yeah. like ideally I will hold 90% of my position for a new low. But if something drops out really hard, I'll definitely take profits because a lot of times that's a tr I, in my experience, a lot of times if something drops out too fast and I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Like it just went in my favor. And it comes back up. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to be taking profits into that. Um, once it's consolidated and spent that much time up into that level, like at the 65 area, a break should be pretty clean. Like not like fast, but it should be, there should be steady selling. If it's gonna go to new lows, there st should be steady selling. So if it goes down a little bit and then ramps right back up, I'll probably exit at least half faster. If it goes to new highs, I'm just out. Like, you know, I, or that, that more recent high, um, I'm just out. But ideally, if it trades relatively cleanly, I'll hold like 90% for new lows and then see. Um, and then start to probably take out half at new lows and then just, you know, kind of feel out what's happening. Very rarely will it like basically go to new low and then flush like a ton. Most of the time it's just like it goes to new low um, and, it's, and it's grindy. Um, but, you know, I'll adjust accordingly. Um, but it's something that, that has helped my trading and I think I've seen it from a couple traders on the desk of You've done all the work to identify this stock. Yeah. Like, don't just take one trade. Like, be open to the different ways it can play out. Like, you know, because I guarantee you some of the top traders on the desk didn't do any more work on the stock than you did to understand it. But they'll trade four or five different trades and, you know, they're getting, they're allowing the stock to reward them more then you're allowing it to reward you just yeah. by being And I know it in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, this is another really good trade. It came back up to 65, short the hell out of it, but I'm like. Yeah. yeah. 
I, but it, it, just it, like this trade a month yeah. ago, you might not have made. Yeah. Like maybe in, two, maybe in a in, month. I'll in be, a month, uh, you might make that same trade, true, right? Yeah. Like you might make that sixty-five dollar trade because you playbook it, because you go back and you review it, because you think through. Oh, this happened last time. You have this like collective of ideas of, I've seen this in Sava. It, it's not that it went to sixty-five. It's the way that it went down, and then the way that it came back up that it's matters to me. Back. Yeah, and that, and then the way that, and it wasn't just the fact that it went up. It was the fact that it went up, and then it spent. I think it took three or four attempts up that just could not lift. There's a big difference between the ones that just go down and go right back up, and the ones that go down, go up, and then come back down. And it's. I think it's because they just keep trying to press it above that important level, and they just can't. Um, and so, so you'll have to develop a playbook for that if you want to add it and mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with doing exactly what you did and just being done with it yeah. <laughs> you know it's a good trade so mm -hmm. um, but the the way I've seen a lot of traders grow on the desk is by taking what they already know on the tape and then using that as in as many different situations as possible because I guarantee you there are guys on the desk that probably bought that long into the 63 flush because they're yeah, like it's down interesting. in ATR. I've, I've heard some people get, take some some longs where I'm like, oh, okay, that's like if it gaps down too much or if it gaps down to a really key level. I've I've always interpreted gap downs as like, okay, it's possible short unless it gaps down just way too much. But um, yeah, it's just all all different types of trading styles that I'm getting used to. So yeah. I'm trying to finding what my niche is and some of those. So. Um, I don't know what I generally know what I like to do, but putting a name to that and um, adding different tools to the arsenal, it's, it's all been really awesome. So, Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they're producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video. From all of us at SMB, train and trade well.